All right, everyone, welcome. Um, this evening we have Mr. Michael Connolly from McAndrews, Michaela Connolly, Hulse and Ryan PC giving a presentation about the update to federal guidance on discipline. And um, Mr. Connolly, thank you for joining us this evening. Um, we really appreciate your time. I know it's the evening and um, I'm sure you already had a long day. So thank you for being here. Thank you to everyone who, who joined to attend. Um, I, I also appreciate you guys having, you know, sharing your evening with us as well. Um, for anyone that is in the Pittsburgh area, Mr. Connolly did assure me that we will be done by the 8.15 Steelers start time. So do not worry, this will not interfere with any football plans. I should have checked the schedule before we plan this. Um, Mr. Connolly. Well, despite, despite the fact that I'm an Eagles fan on the Philadelphia side of the state, mm. so that get a bad rap, I know, as, as sports fans. So I'm trying to, trying to disprove that tonight. Fair enough. Fair enough. We'll take it. We'll take it. Awesome. Well, I will go ahead and turn it over to you. And um, whenever you're ready, you can go ahead and get started. Great. All right. So um, I, I'm a little bit at a disadvantage in that when I go full screen like this, I can no longer see uh, all of your uh, all of your faces. I just see my PowerPoint. So um, I, uh, you know, as we go through this, um, please ask questions. I don't know that I will see if you do, you know, raising hands or put a comment uh, in the comment uh, area or message box. Um, so, uh, Melissa, if anything like that happens, if you could, could let me know, but feel free to unmute yourself and, and interrupt me as we, uh, as we go through. But it, uh, it really is um, uh, better, uh, if possible, uh, to ask questions as we go along. I find that that makes the presentations a little bit more enjoyable as opposed to, to listening to, uh, to me kind of, kind of drone on, although I am a lawyer, so if I have to drone on to get through the time, I can, I can, uh, I can do it. Um, so, uh, we are, <clears throat> McAndrews Law Offices, uh, is a, uh, we've been around for over 30 years, uh, and we, uh, rep represent families, uh, in a variety of education, uh, matters, um, typically special education, uh, disputes, and, and that oftentimes involves discipline issues, uh, with, uh, the schools, the, the, the students, uh, public school district. Um, we do some other matters as well, um, from uh, uh, matters related to uh, harassment, uh, bullying issues at times, um, uh, injuries at school. We also have an estates uh, practices as, uh, as well. So that's a little bit about what we do. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about some updated uh, um, federal guidance that came out on discipline and on, on uh on behavior uh, from, oops, excuse me, all right, from uh, the federal government. Um, there's, there were six uh, guidance documents that came out, uh, came out in the early summer uh, time. Several of them dealt with, with behavior support and, uh, and discipline. A few others dealt with some other areas. So we're going to focus mostly on the on the guidance related to behavior and and, uh, and discipline. So, what is uh, federal guidance? Um, it is not. It doesn't really change anything. The law hasn't changed. The law is the same as it has always been. Um, the the, the uh, federal guidance is essentially the interpretation of a particular law or statute by the federal agency that is responsible for oversight and implementation of that, that statute. So in this case, we're talking about the U.S. Department of Education and within the U.S. Department of Education, the Office for Civil Rights and the Office of Special Education Programs. Uh, and it's their interpretation of some of the uh, regulations and statutes related to uh, behavior supports and disciplinary uh, supports for uh, students with uh, disabilities. So as guidance, it is not, it's not really controlling, uh, it's not binding, if you will, um, but it is considered uh, to be uh, persuasive. It is the department's interpretation of the, of the statutes, uh, which certainly carries weight with courts 
uh, when they're looking at these issues, they will consider federal the the, the federal guidance, and it, it can be persuasive to how the court then uh, looks at it, and should also be persuasive to school districts because it is the Department of Education's interpretation, and it's what they are telling school districts um, to do. So uh, it is important, and there's some there's some good things uh, in the, the the guidance that were always the case. But it's nice to see the federal government come out and say, this is in fact what school districts uh, should be doing. So from that perspective, I think it's helpful. Um, why now? Why are these, why are they issuing them now? And I think we're seeing a few things going on uh, right now that is resulting in, in these updated guidance. We've seen increases in school violence uh, uh, over the, the, obviously back in May, we saw it with uh, Uvalde, we've, and we've seen it uh, over the years with a variety of, of school violence incidents, school shootings. Recently, uh, data was released, although that data has been being collected for some time. So it's to the Department of Education, it's, it's not as new as it is to us, but reading and math levels post pandemic, um, the data from CDC is shocking. It's uh, reading scores and math scores show are showing the largest decline in 50 years uh, that we've seen uh, as a result of post post pandemic. And for those kids who were struggling in reading and math or or reading or math prior to the pandemic, prior to the shutdowns, uh, they are seeing even greater uh, losses than uh, than those who were not struggling before the pandemic. Um, and we are also seeing a mental health crisis post-pandemic. Some of the statistics are really um, staggering. 37% of high school students in 2021 reported that they've experienced poor mental health during COVID-19, and 44% of high school students reported that they persistently feel sad or hopeless uh, during, the past, uh, during the past year. So those are some pretty shocking, uh, shocking numbers. Um, I don't know that it's it's necessarily uh, surprising, but it's certainly um, uh, um, shocking, I think, to see in, in black and white uh, in, the, uh, in the studies. So I think a combination of all of this uh, contributed to the guidance that, we, uh, that, we've, that we've seen come out uh, regarding this. So there's a few different components of the guidance. So there are some components related to funding. There's a component of the guidance related to a new initiative called the Every Student Initiative. There was some guidance uh, about the provision of FAPE, a free and appropriate public education under Section 504 during the, the uh, pandemic. And then we have our behavioral and um, discipline uh, guidance uh, under Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act and under the Individual, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, or IDEA. So we're gonna focus mostly on those last two pieces of, of guidance, but I will um, touch briefly on the uh, on the first uh, first three, and part of the handouts that you will be getting includes uh, this PowerPoint, but it also includes the, uh, the 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 letter from the Department of Education outlining the the guidance and the six documents that were attached to that letter that cover these um, five different areas. So the funding. Uh, talks about funding under the American Rescue Plan, um, uh, the, uh, the ARP, and there's specific funding dedicated in there for increased behavioral supports and mental health services. All schools are receiving this funding. Um, the funding is not permanent. It will go away. They're not gonna keep getting the funding year after year, um, but they have, all the schools are gonna be receiving it. Um, and I encourage families to have conversations with, with their schools, uh, talk and speak up at, at board meetings about how that funding is gonna be used um, in your school. It is there for behavior supports and mental health services. Uh, and that's really what it's supposed to be used for. So I encourage you guys to, for the families to, to, uh, to do that and have those kind of conversations with their schools. Um, the, other, uh, the other two non, discipline related uh, are the every Engage Every Student uh, and the 504 FAPE guidance. So the Engage Every Student is uh, a program of funding for summer and after school learning programs, and it's directly in response to the educational loss from the 
the pandemic. Again, this is funding that is going to be available to uh, to every school uh, within the in the uh, in the United States. So, uh, and it's it's to help remediate some of the loss uh, that students have uh, have experienced through summer programming and and through um, uh, after school programming. And some of you may have already experienced. Uh, uh, over the the summer, getting invite having your child invited to participate in certain summer programs that they might not have otherwise uh, participated in, it very well may be may have been part of this engage every student program. They um, also um, had a uh, issued a, a guidance on the FAPE obligation under uh, Section five hundred four during the pandemic. So this this guidance, uh, I guess it's. Um, uh, the, a bit of uh, better late than, than never. Um, uh, the guidance would have been a lot helpful earlier on in the uh, in the in the pandemic when schools were really, really you know most of schools were closed and and uh, and we had a lot of those issues. There was guidance that was issued for the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act during that time that said the the FAPE obligation continued during the pandemic. Um, that came out around the time of the, the school closures or shortly thereafter. Um, nothing directly came out on 504, but the, the 504 guidance that has now come out more or less uh, mirrors uh, in many ways the IDA guidance and, and says that that FAPE obligation continued um, throughout, the, uh, throughout the pandemic. So now let's focus on the on the, the two discipline uh, areas. And, and as I go through and, and talk about uh, some of these uh, issues. Keep um, keep in mind that I'm not talking. I'm not necessarily talking about every protection as it relates to discipline or behavior support. Um, we could have an individual session just on that. So I'm going to cover some of those, but I may not cover everything. Um, and that I'm just going to try and highlight some of what I thought were the important uh, takeaways uh, from each of the of the two uh, guidance um, uh, uh, sections. You know what, let me, I didn't even realize I didn't actually start the slideshow, did I? There we go, that's a little better, right? Um, okay, so first uh, that I thought was really important that oftentimes I think gets lost is that the non-discrimination provisions of section 504 applied to what they what the guidance referred to as 504 only students and IDEA eligible uh, students. So 504 only students would be students that are eligible um, to receive FAPE under 504. They're eligible for a 504 plan um, and receive supports and accommodations under 504 but don't meet the eligibility requirements under the, uh, the IDEA. Um, not to spend too much time on this, but five, to be eligible under 504, you need to have a disability, uh, and that disability uh, needs to um, impact uh, a major life uh, activity. And that's the extent of the requirements to, to, to be eligible. In fact, you don't even necessarily have to have a official diagnosis under 504. Uh, you can be regarded as having uh, a disability, and that is sufficient to meet that first part of the 504 disability uh, uh, eligibility requirements. IDA uh, is a lot different. Um, there are specific enumerated um, eligibility categories of, for disabilities uh, and specific definitions for each of those um, uh, disability categories that a student must meet. So you can, in theory, have a disability that doesn't fall into one of those categories and would not then be eligible um, or doesn't meet the specific definitions of one of those IDEA categories and would not be eligible. In addition, that disability has to have a, a uh, adverse impact on educational performance and result in the need for the child to, uh, to have specially designed instruction or special education, something beyond what might be done in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a regular uh, instructional uh, model. That requirement for specially designed instruction is not there for, for 504. So a lot of times I think it gets lost that you can 
discriminate against a student with a disability under 504, that is a student that's eligible under the IDA. They don't lose, IDA students do not lose their Section 504 non discrimination um, uh, uh, protections. The IDA is a broader, more robust statute when it comes to FAPE and describing all that goes into FAPE than does 504. Uh, so that FAPE requirement, the IDA really kind of trumps uh, anything that you would get under 504, you would get under IDA and, and more so in theory. Uh, so that the, the, the FAPE obligation uh, for IDA students is different, but the non-discrimination is the same. Another really important part of the guidance, uh, I thought, was that 504 non-discrimination provisions apply to the conduct of those uh, individuals whom the district has a contractual or other kind of arrangement with. Uh, that can include bus drivers, cafeteria workers, and most importantly, they note law enforcement and school resource officers. Um, and that's big in the context of uh, of discipline. So when a school district decides to have um, resource officers, school resource officers, or law enforcement in the building that you know it's not a school district employed security uh, person or a school district employed resource officer, it's somebody that is um, from the local police department that's acting in that role. Um, through whether it's a contract, whether it's a memorandum of understanding, the same provisions that would that the district has to abide by, their contractors have to abide by those. And if those contractors don't, the district is is potentially then liable um, for that. Uh, so they have to make sure uh, that those school law enforcement officers, school resource officers. Um, are you know understand what those obligations are of the school district under 504 uh, and understand when they may be dealing with a student um, who has has a disability if if that a resource or officer or police officer is called into a into a particular um, into a particular uh, situation so you know that could be you know, uh, reviewing with them the idea of using de-escalation uh, text techniques or, you know, particular students generally should, you know, the first thing you shouldn't do is go in and touch uh, or grab at a particular student. Now, are there certain um, crisis or emergency situations that, that will arise? Absolutely. And this, this doesn't prevent uh, a resource officer or police officer from taking, a, you know, appropriate action where, you know, the, uh, uh, the safety uh, or uh, life of, the, of a student or the student himself or herself um, is potentially at, at risk. They can certainly act and this doesn't pre present that. But too often I see scenarios where um, the the, the, the resource officer or the police officer is, is either a, a first line of, of um, defense, if you will, uh, for, you know, the first person that they're calling or that they're calling in situations that are not necessarily situations uh, that pose a danger uh, to anybody, right? So, you know, I've seen it where, um, uh, an, an SRO may be called in where a student is uh, is becoming verbally aggressive or mouthing off or being defiant, however you want to call it, towards a teacher. And that's not to say that the, that behavior is appropriate, um, but you know it very well may be related to the, the the child's disability. And calling calling in the resource officer or police officer for that kind of behavior. Um, uh, is I think going to to an extreme before you need to get there. Um, uh, and if they're going to call a, a person, uh, a, a resource officer in, or a resource officer gets involved in that kind of situation, they you know they need to be aware that the student is a student with a disability, and the, the the school district has an obligation to ensure that that individual is not engaging in behaviors that would be considered discriminatory. Uh, or inappropriate under 504 if they did the same thing. 
Um, so I think that's that's a really important acknowledgement um, by the uh, by the federal government, and I hope school districts um, really take that uh, to uh, to heart. Not every school district does it, but there are a lot where we really see resource officers being um, used in uh, in ways with students with disabilities that really aren't appropriate under the laws. Um, another key component is that 504 requires an evaluation, and that evaluation could include uh, an FBA, a functional behavioral assessment for, uh, for students. So the supports and services that are to be provided to a student, including behavioral supports, need to be based upon uh, evaluative data. That's in the law, it's always been in the law, um, and a lot of times I see school districts um, kind of treat 504 as though they don't really have to do an evaluation. They just get a note from a doctor that says he has, the student has ADHD and he needs, uh, he needs supports. Okay, we'll give the student a 504 plan and we're gonna sit down and, and develop a 504 plan. That's not really what the law says. It does require an actual evaluation. Now, the law does not define specifically uh, what that uh, evaluation um, is, uh, but it does um, um, does require an evaluation so that you can gain information about the students uh, the students' specific needs, and that's really um, uh, important uh, because a lot of times it it, it does not uh, happen, and if you, it doesn't happen, that can be a denial that can be considered discrimination under 504 and a denial of of uh of faith um it also which i think is uh interesting uh that they that they pointed out that a 504 evaluation um is required uh whenever uh a uh a district is determining uh, a change in placement under 504, uh, and that would include a disciplinary uh, change in placement. And we'll talk in a little bit about exactly what that uh, what that means. So uh, again, 504 doesn't really define uh, in any detail exactly what that evaluation has to look at, um, but there's also a general rule out there with 504 that if you comply with IDEA, uh, requirements you have met your 504 uh, requirements so when you when you look at that evaluation if you're doing an evaluation that would be consistent with uh, an IDA evaluation uh, then um, you would be meeting 504 requirements it's not it is not I'm not saying that they have to do an IDA um, evaluation for, for a section 504 evaluation uh, but that is one way to meet your obligation. It's a little less clear under 504 exactly what it, it that evaluation has to be look look like. Although it does have to provide sufficient data uh, to determine the child's needs, and it does have to be it does have to use a variety of information, and it does have to be done by a, a group of qualified individuals. So uh, it does have those requirements, but it doesn't go into the same detail that the IDEA uh, does. Um, Another key component, which is also an aspect of IDEA, but it was nice to see that the federal government recognized this as well. Doing well academically is an insufficient basis to deny uh, evaluation or to ultimately determine that a child is not eligible under 504. Um, again, um, academic performance is not the only uh, basis to be eligible under, frankly, under 504 or IDEA. Um, so the, the the child's behaviors and that and their interference uh, for that child in school is and can be sufficient uh, to uh, to be identified as eligible under 504. Uh, so I think that's another uh, important uh, component uh, to uh, to keep in mind. All right, that worked. Okay, um, so. Schools also have to identify and provide individual behavior supports uh, that a student with a disability needs. Uh, that can include things like counseling services. It can include the development and implementation of a behavior uh, invention, uh, intervention plan. So again, um, this is nothing new. 
Um, but it's again, it's nice to see that the federal government um, note as part of its guidance that those kind of supports have to be provided to, to students with um, uh, with uh, with 504 plans that have behavior related disabilities, um, and that 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 can include the development of a specific intervention behavior intervention plan for the student. So looking at some of the discipline uh, changes. Um, when a district is proposing what's referred to in the law as a significant change in placement, and that's, that is defined as more than 10 consecutive or 10 cumulative days, uh, if the cumulative days is a pattern, and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, due to disciplinary removal, the school has to first conduct a manifestation determination uh, to decide whether the behavior um, that the discipline is proposed for is based on the student's disability. So this is also really nice to see because a lot of, uh, in my experience, a lot of school districts will say we don't have to do a manifestation determination, uh, that that's an IDEA um, provision. And that is that is technically true that the formal manifestation determination process outlined um, in the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act is not outlined in 504. However, this is where that evaluation piece comes in, and this was the guidance and interpretation by the, uh, the, the Department of Education and, and Office for Civil Rights when it comes to 504. And that is that in the context of uh, a significant change in placement for any reason, an evaluation must be done. In the context of a disciplinary removal, that evaluation is, in essence, a manifestation determination. You are determining whether or not the, the behavior is ultimately a, a manifestation of the, uh, of the child's disability. So I think that's really important uh, to, to, uh, to note that that evaluation process um, has to take uh, place, that you as uh, parents um, are uh, to be involved in that, in that process. So again, that is for 10 consecutive days or 10 cumulative days if it's a pattern. And what does a pattern mean? Matt, what does a pattern mean? That means they're looking at a variety of things. What, what is the, um, the nature of the behaviors for which the student is being suspended uh, for, the, for the days? Are there, so let's say it's 20 cumulative days. Is it, are the, they similar uh, in uh, in nature. What are the lengths of each individual uh, uh, suspension? Uh, what, how closely in time are those suspensions related? Is it uh, ten consecutive days, and then the student comes back for a few days and gets suspended again for something similar for uh, another three days, and then? They're back for two weeks and they're out again for five days because of, again, a similar type uh, of behavior. So when you look at all those things together, does that equal, is that a pattern? Does it show a pattern of suspensions, of serial suspensions? Mm -hmm. um, and if it does, then it's then, then 10 cumulative days or anything after 10 cumulative days can also be uh, determined to be a uh, significant change in placement under 504 and require uh, this uh, this process. Mr. Connolly. Yes. There was a comment in the chat. Cindy wanted to know if you could repeat what you said about the evaluation being essentially the manifestation determination for a student with a 504. Sure. So, uh, so OCR in their guidance um, took the the requirement in 504 that, and there is, and there is a, a specific requirement in 504 that says that any time they are going to consider a significant change in placement to a student's program under 504, they must complete an evaluation. So kind of taking it outside of behavior for a moment, that implies there can be different placements under 504, which again is something that I think nobody ever really looks at when we're talking about 504 because we think of 504 as just occurring in one particular environment and that environment is in the in the regular school and that's that's not necessarily a case for 504. Um, so anytime we're going to consider changing that 
uh, placement programmatically uh, within the context of 504. You have it significant, in a significant way. The district has to do an evaluation. In the context of a disciplinary re removal, 10 consecutive days or the 10 cumulative as, as I described them with a the pattern automatically equals a significant change in placement, that kind of a removal. And if that's going to happen, again, an evaluation needs to be done. This is not specifically stated in 504, but, but the interpretation of the evaluation process under this circumstance where it is a disciplinary removal, OCR has interpreted that to mean that you are in essence doing a manifestation determination, that that's what the evaluation is in the context of a disciplinary removal from school that, that constitutes a significant change. Um, the 504 regulations do, however, say that a student's, uh, the district may not discipline a student uh, or uh, suspend or su uh, expel a student beyond the, the, those 10 days that we're talking about where there is a nexus, the, the language that 504 uses is a nexus between the behavior and the, uh, and, the, and the disability. So there's always been a level of you have to make a determination as to whether or not it was a manifestation uh, or there's a nexus between the, the, um, the, the behavior and the, and, the, uh, uh, and the disability. But this guidance says, look, in the context of having to do an evaluation, that is in essence, a manifestation determination. You have to look at data, you have to, to look at assessments, and you've got to make a determination as part of that evaluation process uh, as to whether or not the behavior that you want to, to remove the student for is in fact uh, a manifestation of the disability or is connected such uh, to, the, uh, to the disability that there is that nexus um, between the two. Does that answer the, the question? I believe so. She said, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Um, so again, I think that is, is, uh, is really important, really uh, a key uh, finding uh, for, uh, for, or, for or guidance from the, from the uh, Department of Education. So uh, I think that is very important. Okay. Um, oops, let's do, okay. Another important, um, uh, component to this is informal disciplinary removals are subject to the same 504 requirements. So that is, um, come pick Johnny up. He's misbehaving. It's 12 o'clock in the afternoon. You ordinarily would go to three, but you need to come get Johnny um, and he needs to go home. Uh, that is that is essentially an informal disciplinary removal, right? He's being removed for behavior reasons. Uh, it, we're not formally suspending we're not formally expelling but we're telling you he's got to, you got to come and, and get him uh and uh and and send him home that that counts towards those those 10 days the same protections that would apply to a formal would apply to would apply to a um uh to a, an informal um let me give you some some other examples of things that uh, school districts have uh, have have would fall under this informal. Um, so placing a student on a shortened school day uh, schedule because of uh, of of disciplinary uh, reasons. Now it's possible to go through the 504 team process and do that. Um, uh, again, that would probably require an evaluation anyway as a significant change in placement. Um, but if it's programmatically as, a, as an appropriate accommodation for a student, that's one thing. But if it's done uh, as a result of uh, behaviors as an informal disciplinary um, process or outside of the 504 process, that would be an informal disciplinary removal that uh, would count towards those uh, 10 days and, and potentially be prohibited um, by uh, Section 504. Uh, requiring a student to participate in virtual learning when everybody else is allowed to do in person because of their behaviors. Uh, again, that would consi be considered an informal disciplinary removal because they're being removed from the regular um, uh, uh, in-person instruction because of behaviors and being forced to do uh, virtual. 
the reverse uh, uh, is also true. So excluding a student from accessing virtual learning uh, that all other students have access to because of their behaviors when they're on uh, virtual uh, learning would also be uh, an informal one. Um, informing a, a, a parent or a guardian that the school is going to take formal suspension or expulsion or refer the student to law enforcement or something like that. If the parent doesn't come, pick them up from school, agree to transfer them to another school, maybe an alternative school uh, or, or something of that uh, nature, or agree to the use of restraint or seclusion uh, as, uh, as a means of disciplining the student. Those would all be considered informal disciplinary removals that are subject to 504 requirements. That would include the 10-day uh, rule, as well as potentially uh, violating the, the, um, the non-discrimination provisions of, uh, of Section 504. So again, I think that is, is, uh, is a really big, uh, important acknowledgement by, uh, by the federal government. There is an exception, uh, one that doesn't come up often, uh, but it, and that is as it relates to um, engaging in the illegal use of drugs. So if a student is currently time uh, these things are going on using uh, an illegal uh, substance, then uh, these protections do not apply to that student. If they are um, not currently using, if they're in treatment, um uh for uh for uh the use of of illegal drugs then uh the the protections still do apply so it is only why they are actually engaged in uh the uh the illegal use of drugs that these protections um would not pl apply to uh to students and then 504 also requires schools to make reasonable modification to discipline policies for students with disabilities so what do we mean by that? Um, and, and remember, these five, in particular, 504 applies not only to um, accommodations and non-discrimination within the school setting, but that would also include school-sponsored uh, events. So after school, extracurriculars, sporting events, uh, 504 would, um, would apply. Uh, so you've got to look now, you know, the 10 day exclusion rule that might not be as applicable, but the non-discrimination provisions, um, certainly are, uh, and making sure that they are treating essentially a, um, student with a disability no differently or no more harshly than they would treat a student, uh, without a disability. Um, so making um, reasonable modifications to discipline pol uh, policies. So an example of that. Let's suppose you have a um, an after school program, um, and uh, part of that um, after school program, um, it's let's say it's the yearbook club. Uh, and they have a rule that students um, who interrupt other students when they're speaking at the club's weekly meetings have to miss the following week's meeting if they um, uh, if they kind of continue with that behavior after I don't know, three warnings, let's say. Um, and a particular student uh, that's in the club has ADHD. They talk uh, often. Uh, they frequently interrupt conversations. All part of uh their uh disability um it that applying that rule equally to us to that student could have the effect of discriminating against that student with adhd based on their disability so that might be a policy in which for that student they need to make a reasonable uh, uh modification for that student you know what that reasonable modification would be would really be dependent upon that particular um you know that particular student um you know maybe it's the, you know the student needs more uh prompting in order to comply um so that would be the modification and for another uh situation it 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 may be that we're you know a student 
given their ADHD, isn't going to be able to do that in that environment. And we're going to make a, a, an accommodation uh, for that student overall. So uh, it's going to depend on the individual student, the individual student's needs. But that would be an example of, uh, of what, we're, uh, what we're talking about. You know, it could be modifications to behavior policies could be that we're, you know, you're going to uh remove distractions you're gonna provide space for somebody to calm down when they get upset as opposed to take uh a, you know a, uh, a different action uh you know maybe more disciplinary or more um uh, uh yeah i guess disciplinary would be the word uh that you would uh, take initially and instead we're going to back up and we're going to give the students some space and some time uh to uh to calm down and kind of kind of regain themselves uh, as opposed to taking the step we would ordinarily take with that same behavior with the regular education students. So that'd be another example of how you might make a modification to a discipline policy for students with disabilities. But that that is that is uh, that is required. Um, so those are some of the main takeaways from from Section 504. Um, I'm going to talk about IDA in a in a second here. But does anybody before we move on to I IDA and I I can't can't see you, so interrupt. So unmute and interrupt me. But if anybody has any questions on 504 um, before we move on to IDEA, okay. Okay. Um, so a few important takeaways from uh, the IDEA uh, guidance, uh, and I think this is oftentimes. Um, kind of forgotten about. Short-term uh, disciplinary or behavioral removals, or frankly, not only removals, but um, incidents, right, are a basis, can in, can in of itself serve as a basis to reach to be in the IEP team, because the indication is really that the program and supports that are in place for a student aren't really appropriate because they wouldn't be engaging in the disciplinary or behavioral uh, um, incidents uh, and needing to be removed um, if the appropriate supports were in place. So, um, and the purpose behind providing positive behavioral supports is really to avoid the need to take disciplinary actions. Um, so that's, and, and again, another key thing that the, the, uh, the federal government recognized in this, in this guidance is that that's, that's the whole point. And if they are constantly engaging in disciplinary actions or regularly engaging in disciplinary actions um, or getting suspensions or after school detentions or being removed from the classroom, whatever the case may be, again, it's an indication of um, that the program is inappropriate and that that IEP team needs to reconvene it and look at things. So what, when we're, and again, when we're talking about supports, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on all these different things because, you know, we could spend, um, you know, an entire presentation just on this, but those things include things like annual, you know, the annual goals and, and what kind of replacement behaviors we're going to work on, what types of skills uh, we are going to work on with the student to, uh, to, to develop again, whether it's coping strategies, replacement behaviors, whatever the case may be, supplementary aids and supports, modifications to you know curriculum, behavioral requirements or policies, uh, related services, which could include counseling, uh, uh, including you know guidance counseling, psychological services, things of that nature, and of course the 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 development and implementation of a positive uh, behavioral. Uh, support plan. Those are all kind of part of the uh, supports and services uh, that uh, uh, should be provided. Also, of uh, I think one of the most uh, important things that they noted is that restraint and seclusion are not considered appropriate behavioral strategies to address a child's needs for behaviors related to their disabilities. Um, I, you know, this does not mean that in certain situations, certain crisis situations where the student is a danger to themselves or to, to somebody else, that um, uh, restraint, you know, might not be necessary. Um, uh, and those individuals, however, those individuals should be trained in appropriate restraints and use it correctly. 
restraint should not be your your go-to. Uh, it should be only in the in those most extreme uh, situations. And it is again a clear indication that the program is not appropriate if the child has to be restrained. And that's why in Pennsylvania there is a requirement that whenever there is a restraint that the IEP team must convene to look at the IEP. Um, again, something that often goes uh, overlooked or um, uh, parents are asked to waive uh, the IEP meeting and I, I highly recommend that you don't. Um, you know, if even if that means the district ha having you know ten IEP meetings in a month, well, hopefully, after IEP meeting ten, we'll look at changing something about the about the IEP so that we don't have to have an eleventh uh, meeting. But uh, but again, there there is no there is no research base to support restraint and seclusion rooms um, are in any way appropriate. Uh, strategies to uh, address behavior or to res or really to respond to behavior. Again, in a in a situation where you know a student is in danger, you, the, you know you have the school district has to act, uh, and they're going to be given some leeway there. But as a general uh, uh, rule, restraint and seclusion, um, you know, certainly shouldn't be listed as a support in IEP or a behavior support plan. If it needs to be done, it needs to be done, but it certainly shouldn't be built into the plan. Um, and I, I, I was very happy to see uh, the, uh, the federal government recognize that in their, uh, in their guidance because we see restraint and seclusion um, happening um, far, too, uh, far too often in the in schools. All right, so uh, change, uh, a change in placement for disciplinary reasons um, uh, is not permitted when that uh, uh, when the uh, the behavior is manifestation of the child's disability. So, a change in placement um, for disciplinary reasons under IDA is similar to uh, the significant change in placement um, uh, in, under Section 504. So, it is 10 consecutive days, or and this is this is something that is often missed. 10 cumulative days where there is a pattern. Um, everybody thinks it's 15 cumulative. And the 15 cumulative, is a, it's a Pennsylvania rule. And that rule essentially says that 15 cumulative days is an automatic pattern. And people don't, people, that gets missed, uh, I think, often. Um, so in Pennsylvania, 11 cumulative days could be a change in placement if that 11th day uh, would make the entire cumulative days look like a pattern. Um, uh, day 11, day 12, day 13, and uh, day 14, and day 15 can all be considered uh, a change in placement um, for, uh, uh, for behavioral reasons requiring a manifestation determination in Pennsylvania. The 15 days is a limit on the cumulative days that does not exist. Uh, in the federal regulations. So under the federal regulations, in theory, if it's not a pattern, you could have 20 cumulative days, uh, 30 cumulative days over a course of the school year. I think, you know, you get much past 20, I think it's going to be hard to show that it's not a pattern. Um, but it's possible that, uh, you know, uh, uh, 11, 12 days, um, cumulative days in a year could equal uh, uh, a pattern and could mean that you have to do manifestation determination. Uh, so you, that question should be looked at any time uh, that you are, that there is a consideration for um, uh, a suspension uh, that would um, require a student to be, would, that would result in the student being out of school for more than 10 cumulative days or 10 consecutive days uh, in, a, in a school year. Um, Again, uh, there are there are some uh, exceptions uh, to that rule as well, um, and I, I didn't lay them out here. But you've got the the forty five day uh, interim alternative uh, educational uh, placement uh, that can be done uh, by a school district. Uh, it's forty five school days, and it can be done in um, the situation where there is a weapon. Uh, where there is the possession or use of, uh, uh, of an illegal drug uh, on school grounds or at a school uh, um, 
event um, or uh, that a student uh, has um, uh, caused significant bodily um, injury. So just to take a step back, um, and, and again, this isn't really specifically addressed in the, uh, in the guidance, but good to know nonetheless, um, the, the weapon uh, you're looking at, uh, uh, it's, it's a weapon as defined by the, um, uh, the, the federal crimes code, uh, so not the school code. So there may be things in the school code that are considered a weapon that are not considered a weapon under, uh, under federal uh, uh, law. Um, so, you know, certain types of look lookalike guns, for example, uh, a knife under a, where the blade is less than two and a half inches uh, is not uh, considered a, a weapon uh, under federal law. So in those circumstances, that provision would not apply. It only applies if it meets the, the, the weapon definition. Uh, again, illegal, an illegal drug is as defined by the Controlled Substance Act, um, the Federal Controlled Substance Act. So carrying one's own prescription may be uh, a violation of school policy, but it is not carry, it is not the possession of an illegal drug and does not give rise to a 45 day um, placement. Now, if you know the student is particularly um, entrepreneurial uh, and has decided to sell their drugs to others, their, their prescriptions to other students uh, in the school, that's a different story. It would then count because that would be a violation of the Controlled Substance Act. Uh, but not carrying uh, their own their own uh, their own prescription, and then finally the the um, substantial injury um, is not we are not talking about um, you know he kicked uh, you know my child kicked the his aid in the shin and it really hurt. That's not um, that is not serious bodily injury. We're talking about you know the definition of serious bodily injury is near death. You know, you you you're you're losing uh, the the ability to to use a, a you know to a bodily function or a bodily member. You, you know, you can't use your hand anymore. You lose an eye. Some you know something like that near death uh, kind of uh, kind of of injury for that to really uh, be considered uh, uh, and and come into play. Um, and then the, that 45 days is automatic. It is not uh, the the um, the district can just go forward with that 45, uh, 45 days, and it doesn't matter if it's a manifestation of the disability or not. So those are exceptions to that general rule. Michael, there's a question yeah. in the chat. Sure. In PA, is medical marijuana considered illegal if a student has it in school and the student has their medical marijuana card? That is a very good question. So, uh, and I don't know the answer, and here's why. It, the, it refers to the controlled, to the Federal Controlled Substance Act. So as it stands right now, states are making certain laws. Those laws are not always consistent with the federal law. So under federal law, marijuana uh, is still uh, illegal. There's no federal law about it. States have made, have, have created their own um, uh, medical marijuana. So I don't know. So it's a good, it is a good question. It's not one I'm aware has been um, litigated. I think it's going to be because I think you're going to have more and more um, of those, uh, of those uh, situations. Um, I think most schools are generally going to have their, aside from the 45 day issue, they're going to have their own policies about whether or not students can possess uh, their own prescriptions and they're allowed to have the, this is, we're just talking about the 45 day. They can still take disciplinary action as they ordinarily would, um, within the confines of the 10 cumulative, uh, 10 consecutive day rule, um, for violating school policy that may not fall into one of those 45 day, um, uh, exceptions to the, to the rule. Most school districts, I think, have a policy in which, with the exception of things like, uh, EpiPens or, or things of that nature where a student is capable of, of self-administering require medications to go to the nurse. So you're, I think you would still, whether it's, it's ADHD medication, uh, medical marijuana, whatever it may be, I think you'd still have an issue um, having, having that possessed on the student as opposed to 
being with the nurse, I think you're going to get into more of an issue. Um, again, I believe in Pennsylvania there is a decision on this yet uh, where it hasn't or, you know, not to say it hasn't come up and maybe there hasn't been some sort of resolution between a family and a district, but I'm unaware of any decision on it uh, where I think that the bigger issue is going to be whether they're going to allow the administration of medical marijuana in school um, during the during the school day through the school nurse. Um, and I, I think uh, it will probably depend really on where that's coming from, when the student really has to uh, take, you know, is it a situation where they could be fine by taking the medication prior to school, after school, and not have to do it during school? So I think there's a, a variety of issues that are are yet to be um, decided in any sort of definitive uh, way. So I think it's a bit of a, of a stay tuned uh, kind of situation. So does that answer your question? Cindy, are you good? Okay. Okay. All right. So I will. Uh, I will move on then. Um, okay. So uh, informal uh, discipline actions again uh, are considered part of that ten-day calculation. So uh, those informal discipline actions are the same kinds of things that we talked about as it related to five or four. But there's some other ones that come into play. Uh, here, two in particular uh, that, that come to mind. So first is the in-school suspension, right? So they're not really being removed from school per se, right? They're still in school. Does that count towards that 10-day calculation? It depends. It can uh, count towards that 10-day calculation. So it's going to ultimately depend on whether or not the student is receiving everything that he or she is supposed to receive within the within their IEP within the in-school suspension environment. So um, are they as a result of that in school suspension, are they not, are there goals that are supposed to be worked on not being worked on? Are they not getting the specially designed instruction that they're supposed to get? Are there related services that they're supposed to get that they're not getting as a result of the in-school um, suspension. So if they aren't getting their IEP, then it counts um, as a uh, as a as a as one of the the days uh, towards a, a change in placement. Um, if they are fully implementing the the IEP, then it would not count. My experience, I would venture to say, most in school suspension rooms are not implementing uh, the the IEP. My guess would be most people monitoring the in-school suspension room may not even know which or if any of the kids in that room even has an IEP. Um, you know, they're all kind of just getting work to do and they're in the, in the room. At least that's my experience with it. Um, I can't say that's every district, um, but I think that's the vast majority. So in most cases, I think that in-school uh, suspension is going to count uh, towards the, the, those, uh, those, 10, those 10 days. The other one uh, that comes up is uh, the bus and being suspended um, from, uh, from the bus. Um, so does that count? Um, guidance from 504 would say that if transportation is a related service on the IEP and they're being, sus they're being suspended from the bus, then yes, it would count. If it's not, the guidance from 504 would say that it's, it is not, um, it doesn't count. I take a slightly different uh, uh, opinion. I, I would disagree with um, uh, the Department of Ed and, Vivo and uh, OCR's interpretation of, of that. I think if removing a child from uh, transportation results in the child not being able to attend school, regardless of whether or not it's a related service, it counts or it should count. Um, if they are able to get to school, uh, then it would not count um, because it's, for many students without that transportation, they're not gonna be able to get to school and they're going to sit at home. And if that's the case, then it's, a, it's, a, it's an out-of-school suspension and the district allows that to happen 
it's an out of school. It's a uh, it's an, in my mind it's a it's an out of school suspension, um, whether they call it that or not, and it counts towards the, the ten days. If the parents or a family member or they're close enough that they can walk or whatever the case may be, and they get to school um, and they're able to access school, and it is not a related service in the IEP, then I don't think that the um, the bus uh, suspension would count towards those those 10 uh, cumulative days. So those are two examples of, of, in the context of IDA, where I think there's a little bit more when it comes to informal discipline um, uh, actions than under 504. But all the ones we talked about under 504, you know, hey, you, you know, come pick up your kid. He can't stay here anymore. He's a behavioral nightmare. We're going to shorten his day. Um, you know, he... He, you you have to come and help. Uh, you got to come in and sit in the classroom if you want him to come in, or um, you know even hey you have to come uh, and if you don't go on the the uh, the field trip he can't go. Um, that that's not so much the ten day. That's a that's an anti that's a non discrimination uh, violation of five hundred four again for either a, a five hundred four only student or an IDA student. Um, uh, they can't require uh, that you participate in order for them to go and, and refuse to allow them to go because of a behavior related to their, to their, uh, to their disability. And I think that happens, frankly, um, frequently. Um, so, uh, so, again, all those informal uh, uh, actions count towards, towards, the, uh, towards the, the 10 days. Did I go backwards? Nope, I didn't. I just I think I just repeated that. Um, so again, you've got to provide the the schools have to provide those behavior supports to avoid the disciplinary actions. Um, so disciplinary removal and protections um, and FAPE requirements apply during threat or risk assessments. So oftentimes, a behavioral incident or discipline action has this part of it where there's some sort of, uh, you know, where some sort of more um, physically aggressive or dangerous or even some certain types of verbal statements, um, whether a threat towards others, threat towards themselves. Oftentimes, there is a component of a threat assessment or a risk assessment that is being required before a student uh, returns. Protections uh, that would apply under IDA apply to a student having to stay out of school until that evaluation can occur. It is absolutely fine for a district to say, we have to have this kind of assessment done, um, or we want this assessment to be done. They can absolutely do that. And as long as they are within those 10, 10 consecutive or, or, or 10 cumulative, possibly up to 15 cumulative days, they can keep the student out until that threat or risk assessment is completed. But once they hit, but those days count. And once they hit those days, um, if that behavior um, was a, um, uh, a manifestation of the child's disability, then um, the, uh, the Cannot keep, continue to keep them out of school if it's a manifestation of the of the uh, of the disability. Um, the other thing that was nice to see the federal government highlight that is often forgotten is that under the IDA, after the tenth day, whether it be consecutive or cumulative, after ten days in a year. Any further days, whether permitted or not, whether it's a manifestation, not a manifestation, allowed, not allowed to, to occur, the student must receive FAPE during those days of additional days of suspension or expulsion beyond the 10th day uh, in the school year. So that means they need to be provided services. They cannot just be sit at home, sit at home. And if they are, they may be entitled to compensatory education as a result of it. So anything after the 10th day requires state. Um, again, the location of the delivery of that is going to be different, um, uh, but they require, uh, they are entitled to state 
day from day 11 on of any uh, any removal, including an expulsion from school. They are entire, uh, entitled to receive a FAPE within the expulsion environment, uh, whether that end up ends up being an alternative school or at home, uh, wherever that that is, the district has an obligation to to pay for it. And as part of the FAPE, the the the, the free part of FAPE, um, at no cost to to the family. Uh, so that is often overlooked. Uh, not so much when there's an expulsion. I think most school districts realize there's that obligation uh, during an expulsion uh, uh, if they're able to go forward with the expulsion. However, it's often forgot about uh, from day 11 to, and we know if they go up to day 15 during that time frame, uh, that those five days services need to be provided uh, when that happens. Okay. All right, the protections that we talked about for IDEA students. Well, um, Michael, there's also, a question before you move on. It's, um, would the notorious online option the only option they need to offer? Would it be the only option they need to offer? So I'm gonna take that in light of the obligation to provide faith. Um, is it possible? Yes, it depends on it would depend on the student and whether that online option is 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 safe uh, or not. Um, for some students, it could be. Uh, I think for many, it would not be. Um, uh, but I, I can't say it's absolutely prohibited um, as an option for fake during a, a suspension or expulsion. Um, but at the same time, I can't say that. Yeah, um, it necessarily would be. It, it would depend on the individual student's needs. Um, I think, you know, depending on exactly what that program looked like, how robust robust that program um, would be, uh, you know, would 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 also come into play as to whether or not it it uh, it meant fate. But they are still entitled to fate during that expulsion. Does that answer your your question? I wish I could give you a little bit more definitive answer, um, but without knowing all the, the ins and outs of the of the student and their needs and what their program generally would look like it's it's hard to say for sure well um, she said but if their needs are not going to be met then they would not have any other options jocelyn you can go ahead and unmute if you want absolutely there you go i'm sorry i'm trying to type and i'm like messing up everything no no you're fine <laughs> well um because i always like it i just feel like they always offer online and a lot of times it's not appropriate but that's the only option so are you saying if they offer online it's absolutely not appropriate that they should be able they should be paying for some type of like whether it's homebound or you know home that, those are all those are those are all options and you while and i'm, I'm going to assume this is in the context of of a now if you're talking about a the 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 suspension and we're talking about you know obviously once we hit 15 limited days in pennsylvania it's an automatic mm -hmm. pattern so you're not going to go be you shouldn't be going beyond 15 cumulative unless you're getting into an expulsion so for uh for 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 day um 10 through 15 um it's very hard to challenge it in the moment because by the time you challenge it, you'll be back in school before you ever get to a due process hearing, let's say, or mediate, or any of the due process procedures to challenge this. Um, it's too it's too short of a period of time, as opposed to an expulsion that might be, you know, a, a, you know, a year, a whole school year, or even longer. Um, but a student may be entitled to compensatory education uh, for those days if FAPE was not provided during the, the suspension. But, you know, again, if it's a couple of days, you're not gonna be able to, it's gonna be very hard to challenge that particular removal or that the services during that particular removal because you'll be back in school or she'll be back in school before you're able to get in front of uh, a hearing officer and, 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 uh, and, and state your case and see if you can get a, a decision. However, you can retroactively look at compensatory education and if, um they are uh, ordered to pay compensatory education that could be a motivator for them to come to the table if this if it happens again uh because 
they can assume that if they keep doing the um, online, that you'll continue to get, you'll continue to file, you'll continue to get compensatory education. Um, so hopefully they would they would come to the table. Does that help answer at all? Yep, she said thumbs up. Thank you. Yeah, good. All right, you're welcome. Um, okay, so all the protections that we just talked about for IDEA students, for IDEA students, this does not apply to 504 students. Um, uh, also apply to students who are not yet eligible, but are thought to be eligible. Uh, so um, in the context of discipline, thought to be eligible has a very specific um, disability, or excuse me, definition, which is slightly de different. There's also a thought to be eligible within the context of a school district's child find obligations, which is the obligation to locate, uh, evaluate, and identify students who may be in need of special education, and the failure to do that could result in compensatory education uh, for students. This would be, a, you know, for as an example, student who's been showing indications of a learning disability since second grade and they don't identify them to third grade, they may be entitled to a couple of years of compensatory education as a result of, of, of that. The definition for that thought to be eligible is slightly different than the one related to disciplinary protections. This one is very narrow. So there are three things that can make a child thought to be eligible. That means they, uh, so a parent expressed a concern in writing to, a su to supervisory personnel or the child's teacher about concerns uh, 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 for the child, either behavioral or academic, whatever the case may be. So um, I, 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 one of the reasons why I always say when you have a concern, the phone is not enough. Always follow, you know, if you want to talk and it's easier to talk on the phone, great. Follow it up with an email uh, so that there's something, uh, something in writing to document it. So that's one way to be thought to be eligible. And this all happens before the behavior for which the child is going to be disciplined. Um, you, the parent uh, requests an evaluation or the teacher or other uh, um, similar personnel express concerns to supervisory uh, uh, personnel um, or the director of, of special education about a particular child. The teacher's concerns don't have to be in writing, parents' concerns do. Um, so if any of those three things uh, occurred prior to the, uh, the, the uh, behavior, that the school district wants to discipline for. All the protections that we talked about, the 10 days, the 15 cumulative days, uh, and what we're about to talk about regarding manifestation determinations m apply to this student. Um, the uh, wall and the district should then initiate an evaluation and while that evaluation is going on, all this stuff applies uh, to the student until a determination is made as to whether in fact they are or are not eligible. Um, obviously, if they are, those protections still apply. If they are not, um, they do not. There are a few um, exclusions or, or ways that even if this occurs, that a, a, uh, a child cannot be considered to be a thought to be eligible child for, for purposes of uh, disciplinary uh, uh, protections. That would be if a school district had previously evaluated the student and determined the child not to be eligible for services, or they requested an evaluation and the parent refused consent to that evaluation. So if either of those two things exist, then under no circumstance would they be a thought to be eligible child uh, entitled to protections. Now that doesn't mean that you can't then ask for an evaluation at that time and the district would still have to do that evaluation and make a determination as to eligibility, but they would not be entitled to the protections until after they were found to be, uh, to be eligible um, for services. All right, so the manifestation determination itself, a uh, couple things uh, uh, to, uh, to keep in mind. There's two, uh, two questions. Uh, that need to be asked within the context of the manifestation determination. So the first is whether the behavior in question was caused by or had a direct 
and substantial relationship to the disability? So that's the first question. So you're going to look at things like, all right, well, what's the disability? What are the typical types of um, uh, you know behaviors that you might see or symptomology of the particular uh, disability? How in the past has this disability affected this particular uh, student? Uh, and that's kind of what you're looking at to come to the conclusion as to whether or not the disability caused or or had a direct or substantial relationship to the uh, uh, to the behavior. Um, so that's that's the first step. The second step was whether or not the behavior was a direct result of not implementing uh, the IEP. So we have an IEP. There are certain provisions in that IEP. Those provisions were not implemented. And had those provisions been implemented, we assume we can reasonably assume that the behavior would not have occurred. So this was direct a direct result of their failure to do it. They were supposed to provide a particular behavioral support. They didn't, surprise, surprise, the behavior occurred, right? Um, interestingly, uh, obviously, for a student that is thought to be eligible, there is no IEP, right, yet. So obviously, they didn't implement it. So you have the didn't implement part, um, and the, so the discussion in that case is, uh, was the failure to not have an IEP in place at all? Um, the result of the uh, of the of the behavior. So, if the answer is yes to either one of those questions, one or two, it doesn't have to be both. If the answer is yes, the behavior was caused or had a direct uh, and substantial relationship to the disability, or yes, the behavior was the direct result of the of not implementing the IEP, then it is considered a manifestation of the disability, and the district may not take any further disciplinary action as it relates to that um, particular uh, incident. Um, they would be prohibited from any more suspensions uh, or any sort of expulsion related to that uh, particular behavior. Um, they should also uh, redo, um, uh, if they haven't recently done, a functional behavior assessment and either develop or revise the student's behavior support plan. Uh, at that particular time, if the answer uh, to either one of those is yes. If the answer to both is no, then the district can proceed with discipline to the same extent, and this, this is also always important, to the same extent that they would apply uh, the discipline rules to any student without a disability. If they apply the rules differently or more harshly um, or take action, against a student with a disability that they would not take for the same behavior uh, of a student without a disability, again, that would be uh, potentially discrimination under Section 504. Um, so it, they have to apply it in the same, uh, in the same way. Uh, and they also would then have to go back and, fi and fo follow regular education disciplinary due process procedures. So, depending on the length of a suspension or, uh, um, or whether or not it's an expulsion. There are certain informal um, processes that they have to, to follow or uh, a, up to a formal uh, hearing uh, for a, uh, a board expulsion. Um, uh, but they would have to follow those, uh, those procedures. Any um, decision uh, by uh, the district regarding manifestation determination um, and frankly, whether or not the behavior in question actually occurred um, can be challenged by the family in the context of a, uh, a special education due process hearing to be challenged. Obviously, you, can, you have all your same due process uh, rights, so you can ask for you can ask for mediation as well, um, or you can ask for a, a due process hearing uh, to challenge. Uh, the determination that uh, a particular behavior uh, was a um, was a manifestation was not a manifestation of the disability, and within that, you can challenge whether the behavior occurred at all. If that is in question as whether the, or not the the student actually engaged in whatever behavior it is that is being alleged, um, that any any such hearing is an expedited due process hearing. There's only 
to two occasions in which you can request an expedited due process hearing, discipline uh, issues and extended school year services. Those, those two allow for expedited hearings. So within an expedited uh, hearing, uh, it essentially means that the, uh, the due process hearing, uh, the resolution process, uh, I believe, gets sped up from 15, goes from 15 days to seven days. So you have to have a resolution meeting in seven days. Uh, and I believe the due process hearing must convene within 20 days. Um, and a decision has to be issued um, within, uh, I believe, 45, I'd have to go back and look at the regulations. I believe it's 45 days uh, for the decision and no, there can be no, um, no uh, continuances of that, those timelines. So hearing gets, it gets, you know, requested day one, no later than day 45, a decision must be issued. You can move, a hearing officer can set a date for a hearing anytime in there and that date can get moved as long as the hearing is completed and the decision is issued within the 45 days. Um, so it is a quick, uh, quick process when, uh, when uh, a family challenges uh, those disciplinary proceedings. That also, you can also challenge disciplinary proceedings like that within the context of 504, which I, I did not mention um, before. Um, any questions, any other questions on the IDA guidance or, or, uh, or anything I talked about here tonight? Because if not, um, I uh, kept my promise. See that? Eagles fans can keep their promises too. Um, I kept my promise. And I am going to let you all go uh, in time to uh, see the, the kickoff for the, uh, for the Steelers game uh, this, uh, this evening. So thank you very much, and go Eagles. <laughs> Thank you everyone for attending. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, I will try to get the handouts out first thing tomorrow morning by 10 a.m. is my goal. So look for those first thing in the morning. And if you need anything, I did put my email and my contact information in the chat. And I can always share anything with, with Mr. Connolly. If you guys think of questions after, like I can make sure that you guys, that those questions get to him. So thank you for coming. And you have three, we're, we're done three minutes early, Mr. Connolly, three minutes early. So <laughs> perfect. You can't ask for anything better than that. So right. thank you everyone and have a great night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you.